very much, Lea. So I'm very happy to be with you for this uh, last uh, dialogue for uh, COP27 and in order to take stock of this uh, 20th, 27th Conference of the Parties. Uh, and myself, I'm a participant at, of COP for seven years. And so I'm very eager to hear what our panelists uh, have to say. And so just a little background before we get into the discussion. And so the COPS uh, Conference of the Parties uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, they bring together delegates from governments around the world each, in order to discuss the implementation of the convention and its related protocols, as well as to take actions, decisions in order to address the global climate change challenge. And uh, after it's the responsibility of the governments to implement these decisions and their own commitments uh, within their jurisdictions. And so in November, 2022, the 27th conference was held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And the results of this events have not lived up to the expectation of those who wanted more ambition, more uh, action and, and also so, of course, uh, I will not shock anyone by saying that if we look at our, ourselves as Quebec society, we can say that we are on the move to fight climate change and to adapt to it, but that we are not still up to the task. And so, of course, we have to do more. We also need to, so to do more and faster, and we need to deliver on the commitments that we make at the government level, but also as organizations in the civil society, businesses, individuals, and households, and of course, to the extent that they can afford. And in this context, the government, government of Quebec made major announcements at COP27, such as the $10 million contribution to the Adaptation Fund for Developing Countries and the launch of the Action Climate Quebec program. And also the trade unions and representatives of civil uh, society and youth groups, they're also putting propo proposal solutions and commitments. Uh, so in short, we can only do this if we accommodate ourselves to each other and if we are accountable also to each other. In order to discuss uh, these uh, issues and the roles that we all play, we have the privilege now to have with us today Mr. Benoit Charette, Minister of the Environment to the fight against climate change from uh, Wildlife and Parks, who will join us uh, around uh, 25 minutes. Uh, we also have Magali Picard, and she's elected president of the FTQ on January 20th. So congratulations to Madame Picard. We also have Claire Barnells from, the Mon she's a, uh, Montreal Generation Climate uh, Project Manager. And also we have Mr. Uh, Alexandre gajevic sayeg a PhD Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science at Université de la Laval University. So thank you for having accepted this uh, or our invitation. And so now without further ado, we're going to start uh, the discussion. And we have many questions to ask you uh, as we uh, wait for the minister to join us. And so I will start with you, Mr. Gajevic Sayek. And so you are an expert on Canadian climate policy and international climate negotiations. Could you go back to this COP27 and take stock of the progress made internationally and the commitments also made locally by the govern Quebec government. So what do we, what are the lessons learned? Well, yes, excellent. Uh, hi, uh, everybody. Very happy to be with you today. And it's very uh, wonderful uh, to have been in COP27. So I think that at the international level, there are three things, four things uh, that we have to remember of this accord. Uh, first of all, whatever, uh, something for 30 years uh, that was on the agenda. And finally, we were able to achieve uh, something in the uh, convention is uh, this creation of a fund uh, for the uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, loss and damages of, of for many for uh, countries. So the, finally, the developing countries will have compensations for the uh, loss and uh, damage uh, uh, for which they are not responsible. So they suffer the climate change uh, impacts, uh, but they did not cause these uh, climate change. Uh, and so uh, in COP27, there were uh, great advances uh, uh, to have uh, put in place uh, this idea of having a fund. And I think that after this, uh, we're going to see how we're going to feed uh, the, the different funds. But I would say that this element was very important, not only for the just the uh, climate justice at the international level, but the credibility of the international negotiation. So this is something that we were expecting for something and climate justice was something that was lacking for a long time. And so now family, finally the developing countries uh, uh, really took uh, the, uh, the, the, the lead with this. And so uh, also we could say that the, the deception also or the disappointment around the idea of the diminishment of the uh, production of gas and oil was not part of the text. So we can say that it's another year that we're, we lost uh, in the negotiations uh, at the for international climate negotiation of not talking about the elephant in the room uh, why did we do not uh, diminish uh, why can we achieve to diminish our emissions was well, because of the the production of gas, oil, uh, oil and gas before everything else and we are not able to put forward the idea not just to uh, put a cap on our production uh, but also to diminish uh, this uh, world production this is an indication of where we're going at the inter international level for the climate today. So this is an element that was uh, uh, enshrined. Uh, so uh, after, uh, again, uh, th this was uh, uh, not done during COP27. So this is an important element. A third element also to underscore is the fact that we uh, start continue our work in, with a medal. 50 countries uh, committed themselves to the for the diminishment of the emission of metal, which is a, a very powerful uh, uh, GHG. And so I would say also that a fourth element that I believe that will be really to uh, to to survey, to monitor during the years is the bilateral agreements at a smaller scale, especially with the just energy transition uh, partnership, transition partnership. We saw this with uh, South Africa that was uh, created in COP26, and we saw two others uh, during 27 with Indonesia and Vietnam. So this is very important. Why? Because now we're able to achieve directly, uh, to go directly towards countries that were dependent on on coal. And so now we're, we can go from the transition of coal to, to cleaner energy. So this is a very important element. And I think that we're able to do a lot of progress with uh, agreements uh, that are smaller or more specific on this. Uh, the question to see here is, will this money will be used uh, to go directly from coal to renewable energies, or are we going to go through natural gas uh, uh, along the way? And so I hope that we will be able to have a, a pressure to go directly toward renewable energy. Gas natu natural would be a damage for the environment and at the economic level also, if, if we're going to use this energy. And so I think that in my opinion, these are four elements to remember from the COP, the last COP. Thank you very much. I wanted to have your point of view also when you talked about uh, these agreements uh, regarding the uh, loss and prejudice uh, or damage uh, uh, regarding the government of Quebec. We uh, we heard the government of Quebec that they committed to themselves. Did they play a role in these negotiations? Is this part of the, uh, do you know? Well, this is an important element in the fact that the government of Quebec uh, uh, showed leadership in this. I think the fact of saying, okay, we're going to put uh, Tilmaid on a table, uh, it's not, uh, this is uh, substantial. Uh, this is something that we could, we could see with different actors, but I think what we're going to see in the future it, is the leadership on this question, will it uh, extend itself? Are we going to give exa the example? Are we going to join with other partners uh, in order to give funds that will be very important uh, for uh, the uh, countries that receive this impact? Uh, so I think this is a, a really a good play from the uh, Quebec from the last cup. And also you were saying uh, that the, uh, uh, the you were talking uh, regarding uh, the failure in the last COP uh, for uh, oil production and the next COP, which will be made in the 
uh, oil production country. Is it possible to uh, focus on that uh, with this elephant in the room? It's an excellent question. And this goes even further uh, because we're going to be in uh, Arab Emirates. And so this uh, impacts uh, the Arab Emirates as well as Canada because the president of uh, the COP28 as uh, Justin Trudeau and different leaders, uh, political leaders, uh, they have this, uh, this contradictory discourse uh, on which it's possible and that we should at the same time to develop uh, fossil fuel and develop uh, renewable energies. Uh, but others uh, think that we just uh, see the contrary. And so we can see this ambivalent discourse, which is uh, the Canadian discourse. And because uh, we saw also uh, in Canada is all the projects. It's also the position of the president of, future, of the future COP. And so these are actors, players at the international level that don't, they don't see this as a contradiction, but it is a contradiction. We will never be able to achieve our targets of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction and to stabilize, uh, which we need to diminish radically if we develop both at the same time. And so this is an element where we'll have to underscore, but at the same time, that's why there's a lot of work to be done uh, from today up to the end of the year with COP28. And this is the, the, the network of this, uh, the work uh, upstream. So if not, we're going to have this double speech uh, uh, of these, the development of these two energies. And I can say you, we will never be able to achieve our, our targets uh, of a reduction of emissions with this attitude. We, uh, we understand that we don't have a choice to talk about this uh, more and more. Uh, with the coming years. Uh, and so this is a, uh, we need to go that way anyways. Uh, and we'll have to discuss this in a very serious way. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding uh, the bilateral agreements um, uh, amongst countries, you, you talked about this. I think we're gonna talk about this in a while, but Quebec had uh, already showed itself regarding bilateral, bilateral agreements with other seven federated uh, states uh, uh, with the gas alliance, for example. Do you know if there are other things uh, in the pipeline regarding uh, Quebec or Canada and other jurisdictions in order to move forward? This is a good question, and I don't know, uh, be maybe because there are not any, but these are, these ty this is a type of this leadership. And I saw around the table with a, a, a energy transition partnerships, especially in Europe, I would like to see Canada uh, supporting this uh, type of initiative. I think that we're in a good position in order to move forward this type of initiative and try to go in specific countries and to, to give you the means uh, to not use the coal. This is uh, so essential today. And these countries, most of them, they have uh, uh, coal, uh, they use coal in the household and we're asking them to not use it, but we, we will use uh, fossil fuel for a long time. And so I hope that we will have more. And so we're just at the beginning of this type of uh, a smaller scale agreement, but I think we can progress with this. And we know that with the state of uh, the, the climate uh, crisis today, all good solutions have to be uh, uh, put on the table. And these are part of the solutions that we will follow. Thank you so much. Uh, we will have the opportunity sh um, uh, to uh, relate to what you just uh, uh, said, uh, Mrs. Picard, uh, now. And so FTQ is very committed uh, during its international summits uh, and uh, continually ensures that, that the just transition concepts are uh, incorporated into international climate negotiations. What did the FTQ think of the agreement adopted at the end of this COP? Uh, that, was there an adoption of a work plan for the just transition? So what do you think of this decision and what does it consist of? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to be with you. I, I would have listened to Alexandre all day. What an, an excellent uh, pedag uh, pedagogue. So, but first of all, we have to give a background. The, the last one was on the African count, uh, continent. So it's important to understand the issues of this continent. And like other organizations, we were uh, uh, concerned that this uh, COP was in Egypt where human rights are continually uh, uh, trampled on. And so for example, uh, uh, many of our uh, unions, uh, syndicate members are in prisons. 
and we had negotiations during and after the COP and many members of our delegation uh, received a political harassment. And so if we come back now to this African COP, it was the first, uh, the premier after the finalization of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And so it was the cup of implementation presided by a president, a country, a, a developing country. And we're very happy of the gain of this cup. And Alexandre talked about that this, the creation of a fund for a loss and damage. Why? Because it's the first time that developed countries like Canada recognize there are responsibility regarding a climate uh, crisis and they commit themselves in the for uh, compensation. This is a major, and we're also we see the damage in uh, developing countries by working in solidarity with our union members in the southern coast countries, which they, who struggle for their survival. Act, climate action does not stop at a at a border a country, and FTQ was always ready to be there with international sol solidarity. And however, in, in spite of the uh, giant uh, steps uh, forward. Uh, we have to conclude that the last COP showed us that we're we're really in a cruncher. That means that before COP 21 in 2015, the pro the projection of uh, uh, climate uh, was uh, over six uh, degrees. After the Paris Agreement, the projection went to four degrees Celsius. Since then, uh, it, it has the the gap has diminished. Before the opening or be of of uh, 27, the projections were 2.7 degrees Celsius. And we started from this cup at 2.7. Uh, so what this means is that the next steps will be very difficult. And it's all our economic system that needs to review this, uh, the way that they do things. And so concerning now the work program on the just transition, well, we're very proud of this. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, since uh, COP21 and the international union movement uh, are uh, really, uh, this program will put in place uh, uh, concerted uh, mechanisms of just transition on two axes uh, for unions, the social dialogue and uh, social protection. We have to ensure that the aspects concerning human rights, uh, concerning the work, the rights to work would be included in these mechanisms. And it's important that this, the unions uh, participate with the discussions because as you know, if we're not at the table, it's that we're not on the menu. And I can say we will never accept this. Well, thank you, Mrs. Picard. Uh, so we're talking here about uh, you to really touched upon uh, the notion of human rights, uh, which really is at the foundation of everything, especially for FTQ. How, we know how this is at the center of your mission and the responsibility, historical responsibility of the countries. And so this opening also, and the fact that we have uh, had a COP with a, an, uh, uh, a conclusion which is not as uh, good regarding the degrees. And we're talking about the uh, different steps uh, and the, to review our ways of doing things. When we're in a big uh, uh, union like FTQ, how do we, uh, how do you achieve these ways of doing things when you're in a state of uh, climate emergency and the, the growth of uh, social inequalities uh, is always uh, growing? Well, we talk about social dialogue and I can talk to you about, uh, well, I could uh, put myself in the 600 workers that we represent. It's important for the government to uh, start to, to launch this dialogue process. Why? Because we all have uh, what we call uh, echo anxiety. We don't have the tools. Yes, it's good to have a dialogues of experts. And I, like I said, I could listen to Alexandre and so on this topic, but the reality is that the people that we represent have uh, need tools, expressions in a dialogue that they understand in order and not to put this responsibility always on the government, on a, uh, on a neighboring country. All people have to take, uh, everybody's a, uh, an actor of change and this is crucial. And so in order to answer easily to your question, and honestly speaking also, it's to be on, to take ownership of this and to make it accessible to all and to establish this dialogue in order to ensure the workers we're talking about just transition. Some people are working in businesses now that are very aware of what they're doing is not necessarily very positive for our environment. But when we want to talk about transition and that they're concerned and for example, house, so they need their employment, uh, 
uh, how to uh, to touch this top topic while reassuring workers and make them as a stakeholder of this process. So this is the emergency uh, at FTQ is to make this dialogue accessible and to work with our people and in order to develop, uh, to evolve in the right direction in respect of uh, the families and the people that we represent. Thank you very much. And what I understand is that you worked very hard also in order to uh, bring the issue of the just transition to the COP27 this year uh, so that everybody prepare themselves for that. I don't want to, maybe you don't have the answer, but maybe Mr. Gajevic can help you. But when we want to prepare uh, the now COP28, how, when do we when are we able to bring up these topics uh, which need to be uh, uh, discussed in a future COP? Does it take months and months of work? Uh, are you aware of this? Maybe not. You, 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 yes, I just arrived, but uh, of course it requires a pre preparation, reflection. And of course on our side, I think that we, uh, we can uh, have this quality is to be very down to earth. Uh, some, uh, these are questions that are, uh, uh, that uh, common questions and also uh, in three years we don't have a this is a position uh, environment uh, specialist we're very proud to have Patrick Kondo who is helping us with uh, helps us to uh, to reflect uh, collectively of what we need and how we want to uh, achieve this in the different cops uh, and so this it's a this is a constant process it's something it's not something we get up in the morning okay they, we have a meeting in a month and okay where are we going with this uh, and how we're going to start uh, the, uh, touch uh, discuss this topic but it's to bring this in our meetings and our debates and to have this stop and to talk about this and to maximize uh, the opportunities that we have as an organization to have debates and to bring reflections regarding this so for us uh, this is a constant topic uh, at ftq thank you very much uh, and now we will go to our third panelist and uh, not the least uh, that I have uh, met in the COP27. And so COP27, for the first time, there was a, uh, a pavilion that was for children and youth. And yes, there were children. We were not used to see that. And so that was one of the first times for me. And also in the closing agreement, uh, the delegates urged uh, countries to appoint uh, young people to negotiating teams uh, for future climate negotiations. Claire, uh, from your perspective as a young climate activist, how did do you feel about all of this? Have you found that young people are sufficiently representative in the negotiation spaces? And what are their contributions? Uh, yeah, I can see your your nod, your nodding. Uh, so, what are their contributions to international climate negotiations? in order to convince the countries of having them with you. So do you think the advances are up to the climate emergency? Well, first of all, no. That's my, my, uh, my answer to most of your questions. But for me also, I would like to thank everybody for being part of this panel. Thank you for your invitation to participate. And it's really important that we have the opportunity to have these discussions and that young people uh, be invited. And so thank you. All the elements are there that you quoted that were there during the COPS uh, are really uh, within a long history of uh, youth uh, struggling to have a voice at the table. For and uh, and as everybody knows, uh, for the past and for today, this uh, this future uh, was done without the involvement of uh, consultation with young people. Even though when we make decisions on uh, essential, uh, the uh, uh, very uh, essential uh, uh, questions for the future that will affect future generations, and uh, that affect uh, in a disproportionate way the future generations of young people. So within the within the uh, the framework, uh, the UNFCCC. Uh, so the young people were not uh, stakeholders. Uh, and so this is the date of creation in 2005. We see the evolution of that. And last November, the uh, youth uh, pavilion give the youth to the youth an opportunity to be present at the COP in a, with a physical uh, space that was organized to discuss of our needs and objectives, collective objectives. but. If you consult uh, the Declaration of Youth uh, 
with uh, COP27 uh, were, were redacted before the negotiations by youth delegates uh, in many countries around the world uh, and many communities. You will see that there's still a lot of work to be done regarding inclusion of young people and, and intergenerational uh, dialogue in the COPs. And so you're right, uh, the calls were uh, so to involve more youth people in the delegations, there were calls also to what to do here in Canada and Quebec, like in Mexico also. So to form, to train youth people to represent countries as negotiators at the uh, table of negotiations. For me personally, I was able to talk with Steven Kuhn, which is one of the main negotiators of, of Canada or for Canada. And it, we talked about the introduction of this uh, program uh, in Canada. We'll see that where this will lead us. But briefly, for the advancements uh, regarding the youth file and uh, intergenerational justice, so this uh, is something that uh, really have uh, important for me. Here in Canada, we uh, need to do more and we should do more. We have those resources, we have to go further much further and the, the representation regarding capital we have to say it with our minimal the young people they i would say are uh, desperately need to have our voice to be heard in the decision process of our country of our province regarding climate uh, and so after the during the cup as well as after the cup and so those who don't know it it's really the reason why young people from Quebec are being mobilized for the creation of a youth, a permanent youth con co committee uh, for climate at the SM, uh, National Assembly here in Quebec. And so uh, youth uh, commitment to who establish opp significant uh, opportunities for uh, consultation comments uh, of inter intergenerational dialogue during a, a decision process uh, for the environment. Also at the federal level, we see like France and even within the uh, uh, UNFCCC. So we really need uh, at the provincial level to, uh, to, to, we need this committee where a lot of uh, environmental decisions are being taken. And we hope that uh, our provincial government will commit itself uh, to study the possibility of creating this uh, such a committee where we will and we will be able to then to move uh, forward and creating hopefully one d this year and then finally i would i would uh, i would add in my long comment that one of the things that uh, generation climat montreal uh, underscored in each one of our meetings uh, and with the ministers and also the provincial members, uh, it's important to increase our objectives without uh, starting a debate. But there's like a principle in English that says, uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so that's why the target, I think, in my personal life, uh, in our relationships, uh, it's an issue which uh, creates a lot of disappointment uh, 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 among young people is that uh, our, our targets uh, is not at the height of uh, our uh, of 65% of reductions according to the 1990 projection. And so we hope that this uh, can really uh, talking about the Glasgow signature, which uh, which obliges us to review a, a, a target that we did not review since uh, 2015. We see that we want to elevate uh, our target to 65%. Thank you very much, Claire. So we had a lot of messages to go to to transmit. And so the issue of the target, the inclusion of youth people, the training of young people in order to be part stakeholders, we talk about the strong mobilization of young people in Quebec. And history, uh, historically speaking, also, uh, Quebec always had a strong mobilization in the COPS, uh, the, we're the ones that have the greatest delegation. And so today in February 2023, uh, to prepare to 20 for COP28, what do you do? 
because uh, we're going to receive uh, the minister, uh, the environment minister of Quebec, but regarding Canada, because this is a country which is moving uh, negotiations forward with uh, at the table of other, uh, other countries, what do you do in order to ensure and what we can do to help you to have young people at the negotiations table for next November? Well, my answer for me will reflect uh, for sure the theory of uh, the change theory and so the importance of uh, of meeting our elected members even though they're not elected members who represent our uh, circum uh, writing but to have uh, to go forward and to to meet uh, people who uh, from the opposition party because it's through them especially uh, especially if there's a consensus it's with them and uh, where we have that's how we have a opportunity to put more pressure on the, our government and so we're lucky in montreal to have the the federal minister of environment minister here based here and so there's a lot of opportunities uh, before us and there we're just starting the work because we understand that the agendas for cops uh, are established uh, many months in advance. Uh, so, and I understood also that there are countries for which we already have uh, youth representatives who are part of negotiation teams like Mexico, you talked about France also. So maybe we can compare us, uh, we can compare ourselves to put more pressure Yes, France is a country where there already is a youth committee on climate. And so, but I talked to a negotiator, her name is, uh, I think it's Cam Camilla, I think her first name. And she met many young people at the youth pavilion and during COP27. Uh, and she talked about this program. And she talked also that Generally speaking, uh, Canada and Mexico, they have uh, they agree pretty much together. And she talked uh, a lot with the negotiators of Canada of the possibility of introducing such a program here. <clears throat> so I think that they are aware that it's being done and we can see young people at the negotiation table. It's uh, something which is very impressive to see. And it would be cool to have more uh, youth representatives during the uh, negotiation teams uh, in Canada. Absolutely. So thank you very much. And it's, I think we can really uh, give this uh, our, uh, to, to make a mission of, uh, of helping with the interdurational, uh, the minister. Oh, hello, Mr. Charest. I hope that thank you for coming to this event. Uh, and so can you hear us? Uh, I think that you are connecting right now. Yes, hello. I'm sorry, sorry for the link was, uh, seemed to be uh, broken in the link. So how are you? Yes, we're very happy to have you with us and we're talking uh, about you for since for a while now. So, so listen, you're the better positioned uh, in for, to know Quebec uh, we're going is going to need a uh, close collaboration between the different uh, sectors of uh, the Quebec uh, society to move forward with uh, their commitments and achieve their objectives and in order to promote uh, uh, intersectorial dialogue we thought about uh, giving the opportunity to each one of the panelists to ask you one question to you, Mr. Minister. And so I hope you're ready and I will start uh, with uh, Mr. Gajdevic. Yes, uh, hello, Mr. Uh, uh, Minister. I'm happy to meet you today here. I have uh, two small questions. Well, they're not so small, but uh, <clears throat> Quebec uh, signed a good, uh, two good, good opportunities at COP26 and 27 regarding having joined, uh, joining the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance and also uh, providing assistance uh, to the most vulnerable countries in their fight against climate change uh, for adaptation purposes. But my question for you now, what uh, kind of leadership uh, 
could uh, Quebec have within the Federation and at the international level to ensure that the reduction in, of uh, o o global oil and gas production is formally included in the international agreement at, signed at COP28. And so the reduction of uh, oil and gas production, what can Quebec do? And also second question, what kind of leadership could Quebec have within the Federation at the international level to ensure that developed, uh, more developed countries increase their level of commitment to supporting the least fortunate countries in uh, decarbonizing their uh, economies? Well, two uh, good question. And first of all, I'm sorry, uh, I had difficulty to connect, uh, but happy to be with you. Regarding uh, the uh, Ogada participation was uh, to sign its uh, membership. And when I say that the easy part, it's a commitment uh, that could have uh, stayed without uh, follow-up, but we went further uh, in the coming, uh, maybe in the coming weeks and months, uh, there's a bill that was uh, tabled, not only, and it was tabled, uh, adopted also. And so we're one of the rare states in the world that have taken a, such a commitment. And so uh, to have a very real potential of economic development. And the reason why we made this decision, which is the, the, is the principle of uh, uh, carbon, uh, locking and so uh, yes we, in the moment we re, we, we uh, limit the imports it's preferable to have a local product oil gas uh, uh, instead of imports but when we start investing in inf such infrastructures we will be less and less proactive afterwards in order to diminish our dependence on fossil fuels and so the signature is one thing and then we need to follow up on this on this in a practical way and this is what we are able to do regarding the leadership uh, at, uh, at the canadian level without judgment uh, we are all uh, different uh, different places and so i'm not i don't feel that i'm legitimized uh, to give lessons to anybody regarding uh, at the canadian level what i was saying to my uh, counterparts, uh, when I meet them, is to, to sign VOGA doesn't mean to adopt necessarily a law, a bill that we did. Of course, if other provinces want to do it, that, that would be a good thing. But what we say, this is an opportunity uh, to uh, start uh, to decrease uh, our dependence on fossil fuels. And when we look at the other signatories, uh, they're not uh, able to adopt such a bill, but they have a, a special plan to diminish their dependency on fossil fuels. And this is a, an approach that could be possible by the other province, Canadian provinces, if not internationally. This is a role that we assume for a year now, this uh, membership to OGA. And I'm part of this uh, different meetings at the table. There are federated states, uh, France and Denmark, uh, Stelka, uh, Washington, uh, the state of Washington also uh, joined just a few weeks ago. And so this is uh, then to repeat uh, the same speech. Uh, if you can adopt bills like, like you, we did, good for you. If not, uh, this could be uh, going uh, that every year we have a target of diminishing our uh, fossil fuel use. And I'm very happy. Uh, I put a lot of hope in the VOGA when we look for the coming years, the, what is uh, the leadership of this uh, alliance. Uh, but the first meetings that we had, <clears throat> I think really are encouraging. Very, I'm very encouraging for the future. And for international help, uh, it's also fascinating. I, I, I confess, uh, during uh, COP27, we had uh, w there were pledges uh, where the, st the states uh, were committing themselves uh, with financial commitments. And I did this uh, for Glasgow. I did it also regarding COP27. And I also I went just after United States, so it was fascinating that uh, and I'm doing a pledge uh, about 50 million, I think, that they uh, the, Amer the the U.S. Uh, for a fund in order to adapt for the adapt adapt adaptation of climate change and 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 so here uh, I just uh, came uh, after Tering, who is a renowned uh, international on behalf of the United States. I can't remember 20 or 50, but even though if it's 50, I come here right after with uh, 10 million. But if you keep all those proportions, $10 million for Quebec versus 50 million for all of the United States, 
well, these are two different worlds. And so it's just to see to what extent Quebec uh, uh, really uh, is pioneering uh, the, regarding the uh, federated states who are contributing to these funds. There is uh, not a lot of comparisons uh, in, the, in the years that I attended. Uh, many times th there are countries, uh, the federated states that for that Quebec is uh, taking this lead. So for me, this is sending a wonderful signal. And I hope that there are other federated states uh, that can commit themselves. And we talked about the adaptation adaptation fund, but now we heard a lot about in the COP27 also, and even COP15 regarding uh, the climate change and the impacts on biodiversity and the necessity to create new, a new fund. And so Quebec will be present uh, the if the intentions are being confirmed. And we have a wonderful opportunity with the Cli International Climate Cooperative Program that can be adapted uh, for the production of uh, biodiversity and ad as well as adaptation fund for climate uh, adaptation. So I'm very happy and very impressed to see uh, the leadership, the Quebec leadership uh, during these uh, moments. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Charette, a very complete answer. And so maybe we will rebound on this. I would now invite Mrs. Picard uh, uh, questions, uh, has a question for you. Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Leila. Yes, uh, hello, uh, Minister, and thank you for this exercise. Uh, as you know, thousands of workers in various economic sectors are worried about their future. Although the FTQ is trying to convince you to adapt the concept of just transition based on international consensus and various agreements since 2019, we have been slow to see something concrete, practical in Quebec. Mr. Charette, what do you have to say to these workers? You know, I invite you to speak to them directly, not to me, but because not to me because they increasingly, increasingly feel that Quebec is abandoning them. Well, I want to greet you and thank you and congratulate on your new uh, role. And so regarding the just transition, is also very important uh, during the different COPs. This is a notion that we see more and more appearing in the different uh, speeches and different writings. Uh, so the answer that I give to you is uh, in the situation here in Quebec is that it is different in the sense of that it's not a, there's not a share of industry who is called to have disappeared on a short-term basis, for example, uh, with the United Kingdom, Otia, they were many workers uh, with the uh, coal industry who in the near future, uh, if the uh, uh, tr uh, energy transition is being uh, implemented, they will be, have to be requalified. So we don't have this reality here in Quebec. And especially in Quebec, we have a reflex uh, for many years. When we know that a, a company is in difficulty and going to close shop, well, there is an accompaniment, a coaching, which is assured with workers in order to requalify them to, or to, to find a, an, 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 a work. And so there's a reflex, which is implemented in order to not leave anybody behind. But by saying that, so we're, we're not saying also we can involve also each other in, in this concept of just transition. And also you have uh, at FTQ uh, a colleague, uh, which Patrick Rondeau, and what I say to Patrick, uh, President, don't uh, present a practical uh, uh, project and we will study it together and, and achieve it together. So I reiterate this invitation today. This is an invitation which was launched uh, to the uh, your people uh, uh, who wish to work uh, on this uh, topic. So the invitation is there, uh, is reiterated. So we would be very happy to receive a project. Uh, if not uh, <clears throat> during that time, their initiatives, if we look at the implementation plan on a, a green economy policy, there's a component of uh, requalification. And we also worked in a practical way with the uh, working market partners uh, for the transportation sector. So there's a specific mandate which was entrusted in order to identify work uh, 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 objectives, uh, priorities, what are the impacts on the workers uh, uh, of this industry. And so this is a mandate which will be finished 
And from the start, I want to say that uh, when this uh, mandate will be accomplished, we will be able to commit another one. So not only do we want to work per industry, but there's also a reflex in Quebec uh, to, to work with workers when uh, when the uh, whatever sector, when they see their job uh, being uh, threatened. And so this is a project that can be developed together in the uh, coming months. Uh, uh, could I continue, uh, Leila? Well, thank you for the invitation. And of course, I would like uh, us to meet. Uh, I talked uh, before you're uh, coming, joining uh, to the, uh, our, how we're proud to have Patrick Rondo with, uh, there are a few projects that was tabled. What's important for us is that we understand that climate change that have impacts on our workers right now. And so the other thing also is that it's not just to accompany during a loss of work. We already have unemployment insurance. A just transition for us brings another recyc recycling uh, uh, regarding employment. And so this is very important, but thank you for your invitation because we will certainly have the opportunity uh, to meet you and if close uh, in the coming future, because this is a priority uh, file for FTQ. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Thank you for both of you. and. This is a discussion which I think will uh, take more and more space in the coming months. And so Claire now, so the floor is yours. Yes, uh, so I want to thank you, Minister, Mr. Charette. Uh, so it's very cool to have you here on this panel. And as you said, uh, as you know, last April, there was a, um, so there was a motion calling on the government to examine in a horizontal inclusive participatory and transport, transparent process the creation of a permanent youth council committee on climate change received the unanimous consent of the national assembly last december during the an all party debate on cop 15 issues you stated that you wanted to include a, st a standing youth committee on climate in the budget that will be tabled next march my question is this what uh, will be the government's process to include uh, uh, what has been what has what, what was done since uh, April and what will be the government's process to include the issue of the standing youth committee on climate in this spring's budget and what is the approximate amount you thought you would be uh, that would be proposed so very happy to find you uh, just to mention there's a nuance it's not through the budget, but through the representation of the next uh, implementation plan. And so regarding uh, the uh, green economy plan, what we do is we use uh, carbon uh, revenues and we have the equivalent of our own budgets. And so the government of Quebec will use uh, the budget, uh, publish its, its budget in March, and then we will publish our uh, budget in the, in the following weeks to present uh, the implementation plan number three. And so it's really our, within our intentions to follow up on this motion of the National Assembly. We are looking at how we can implement this uh, uh, consultation, youth committee uh, consultation, and I repeat, we uh, deplore the the uh, a few years ago, which was a good structure, was uh, to accompany this matter that does not exist anymore. So we have to work with this reality now. The implementation plan should uh, uh, put the foundation for those who uh, are associated. It's like the budget. We're in like a confidentiality. We are kept. Uh, by law, we cannot talk about uh, budget measures at this moment, but naturally uh, speaking, when the, when we talk about there's a, when an amount is uh, attributed, we will ensure that the uh, follow up will be efficient, but also to have the financial the required financial support in order to accomplish uh, the final finality of this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Charret. I think you have uh, also commitments and you cannot stay with us until the end. Is there a hope, a uh, message of hope that you would like to share? Well, is to see the mobilization here in Quebec and for uh, an environment minister, and I say it smiling, it's sometimes it's not just uh, uh, bothersome, but cumbersome, but how can I say, without uh, seeming to offend. It's like 
it's a pressure which is uh, a constructive pressure and it's uh, it's not always the good uh, results uh, because at the international level these are raised uh, in a wonderful way and it's wonderful how quebec is received uh, in quebec it's a bit more difficult to have this uh, acknowledgement but it's okay because uh, this is what i wanted to say it's a it's a constructive pressure that helps us to do more and so i think that we made commitments uh, uh, strong commitments uh, during uh, cup 27 uh, and also regarding the commitments for cup 15 which are promising also that were taken and we're also accompanied with a good uh, results uh, regarding biodiversity we transfer more and more now and so this is a pressure which is all not always recognized in, in quebec it's a constructive uh, pressure which allows us to move forward and so i say to people continue move forward and also the implementation plan number three which will be uh, presented uh, like i said in a few minutes in the coming weeks it uh, will be for me i think a signal of encouragement a strong encouragement and interesting. We uh, hope to see a lot of budget to accompany us. So this will be the opportunity to see where we are at regarding the objectives and the percentages in order to achieve our target. And so this will be a pivotal moment, uh, an encouraging moment. And this will be our guide in a certain way for the coming year. And it's a wonderful innovation that was uh, done with the implementa implementation of the uh, implement implementation plans uh, revised annually with different uh, updates uh, on an annual basis in order not to lose any years. As you remember, not far away, there was a fund, yes, and we put in place a, we put in place a program for five years, even though the program did not give the, the, the results and we lost a lot of uh, uh, precious time and funding. So each year now we have a new implementation update. Uh, uh, if there's an initiative which does not deliver the results, well, we don't want to lose uh, the time and finance. And so we reinfer, reinforce or replace. And so we're more flexible and the percentage of achieving regarding uh, 2030 should be confirmed at that time. And just to give you an, an idea, we're at 42% at the first year and we're 51% uh, the next year. And I have go a good hope that we will approach uh, 60% uh, next spring. So that means that if we add uh, these percentages uh, year after year, well, we will have our 100% uh, in 2030. And unfortunately, we will be the rare states uh, in the world to achieve this uh, target, but hopefully in Quebec for its credibility and its the leadership that they want to, assume, uh, to take uh, with these questions. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I understand that we will be uh, uh, expecting the implementation plan that will uh, and budget that will come out in next spring. Thank you for being with us today. Yes, sorry that uh, uh, caucus uh, starts uh, in f in five minutes, but very happy to be with you and to 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 exchange on these important questions. Thank you, and thank you for your answers. Uh, I will be able to take them up in my courses. Very appreciated. Have a Okay, thank you very much. So we will continue. And so thanks to uh, Ms. So Minister Charette's intervention, we have a better idea of the government strategy for implementing the commitments. Uh, well, we, uh, that's, we have expected that, but uh, they confirmed certain elements. Uh, and I would like to hear each one of you what do you think uh, of your role, the role of the civil society in Quebec in the coming year, and also beyond uh, the implementation of these commitments? How can we ensure that the government lives up to its commitments? And we invited you to put, uh, we were invited to put pressure, so they wish this. So I would like to hear you. Claire, I'll start with you. Yes. Uh, my intervention, the exchanges, we can talk briefly in my role as a Generation Climat Montréal project management. We will continue uh, our meetings uh, with the, uh, especially the opposition member members to maintain a pressure on our government itself, but also we have to work on the other side and to ensure that the government 
and the other members of the um, National Assembly also put pressure also on this is the way that the way it works. So this will be part of our strategy. I can say that there will be uh, progress on the, on the coming months on this, and we will go to Quebec to do more work uh, by, by spring, not just once or twice. And our allies also, Oxfam Quebec, Alecotec from the University of Montreal, and same issues. And we, there was a youth consultation during COP27 last November. Uh, we, in order to ask the question, what would be the structure and the ideal functioning of such a committee? What would be its role at the National Assembly? And so we would like to have this final report to be tabled uh, in the spring in order to move forward with this uh, file, at least. And for the other files, I'll, I'll leave uh, the other co-panelists to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. And I think that we have also, uh, we all need to, to see in our activities how we can support the youth in all its uh, claims. And so this we try to do this uh, but if there are things that we don't do well collectively in order to put give space to the youth, it's a good to that you reminded us of that. And now, Mrs. Picard. Yes, uh, thank you, Laila. Well, I want to come back on what we heard uh, from the minister. It's uh, concerning to associate uh, when I hear the minister saying, well, there's no employment uh, that are threatening Quebec. Uh, I can say that it's not our observation. So we really need to dissociate uh, this speech uh, uh, where there's no risk of a uh, 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 job uh, loss. Uh, the, the climate change uh, threatens uh, jobs in Quebec. This, uh, we don't want to deny this. And so how are we gonna put uh, pressure on the government? Well, I can say that we he you heard us, uh, we're going to do at FTQ to meet uh, the minister in the coming weeks. It's our role at FT FTQ. This is what we do. Uh, yes, with environment, but also in other sectors. And so very, this is very concerning what I hear. And we are told that, that okay, I hear the minister saying, I'm uh, expecting a project. There are, there are many projects already that were uh, tabled by FTQ, and so I don't want to take this opportunity that the minister left to say that it's not exactly what I have as a scenario, but what's uh, for, but for, for sure we're going to retable them, we're going to present ourselves to the minister, we're going to stay positive. I've, I've been, I'm new in my position, but I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, meet the minister and to pursue him for this because we're there in FTQ to protect workers and employments. And also we're there to protect also all the population and our planet is important. And so what we want is to accompany workers uh, towards a just transition. And that's very important. And so FTQ plays a, a role of the civil society it's uh, essential for us. And it's for this reason that we want to establish dialogues for climate and on climate. And this is in our minds for many, for a long time. We also hope to gather all the Quebec civil society who are working, working uh, with all the COPs and with all the issues of international climate negotiations. As, and as you know, COP lasts a week uh, per year and it's preceded by three work sessions the convention, uh, the UNFCCC. And so there are times of meetings uh, at the national levels uh, for weeks a year. So it's not at this time that we're going to reinvent the, the world and and deal and find solutions for the whole planet. But these are moments where we need to have a constant dialogue in Quebec, and this will allow us to move forward with the climate ambition by negotiating for sure uh, uh, framework conventions. And so our role during the COPs uh, is to ensure that the language is more ambitious and more restrictive uh, 
and uh, constrained to, to uh, uh, and so work the, our work doesn't stop there of course the main role as civil society is to ensure that the international climate crisis be translated as in practical uh, actions uh, and that's where the work is so important we have to remind the governments their commitments uh, their responsibility and i'm committed to that and this uh, requires a, a lot of work uh, consultation work and pressure at the local level as be as well as being coherent uh, concept, uh, with our uh, what our colleagues are going through in the developing countries so we're proud at fdq uh, to be part of this uh, as an example, our governments are very good to listen, but do they really listen to us? Do is there practical actions that uh, reaches our, our our objectives? The FTQ thinks that we have to stop to be concerted of the climate emergency and to deal with it. Thank you very much for this choice of uh, words. Uh, very important. Uh, I had a question, a specific uh, detail, in order to. Uh, shed light on people who maybe who are not uh, uh, maybe up to par on the just transition. When you talk about their job losses that are announced, can you give us a few examples uh, that come to mind? Because this would help us to understand a little bit what uh, this uh, transition means. Well, we have a no idea right now of what are exactly these uh, jobs. Uh, we have to do an in-depth study and we have to establish dialogue. The government does not want to do this exercise right now. And that's why the minister can say just like that openly, well, listen, there's no loss, job losses. Of course, when we don't have an approach, when we don't have a study, we're not able to support uh, our, these type declarations with numbers and, and, uh, and with uh, titles, job uh, classes. And of course, uh, I'm a member of First Nations, uh, a lot of people who live uh, with fishing and hunting, and this comes in our territories. Go and talk with these people who are uh, depending on nature. They'll talk about uh, in a very urgent way of the needs uh, of acting. We can see this also in certain uh, issues. I, this morning, I was with the National D Director of Metallo, and there are concerns that they're in negotiations right now with their employees and employers. And so there, there, there's a concern with the employees will we exist in 15, 10, 15 years. Yes, there are impacts, but at the same time, this is an exercise that has to be done that the government has to do. We want to work with them, but what we know is that there are impacts and yes, there are impacts on workers right now. So right now you're receiving the concerns, concerns of your members, but we're not able to really measure specifically who will be impacted. And so this concern is, is in, Yes, and I want to specify also, when we talk about just transition, it's not just for us equal to job loss. Just transition for us is to take a business company which pollutes and to improve this business, uh, its mission, and give them tools and to train, of course, uh, the, the labor force that they need in order to adapt to this new reality. And so for me, the just transition is something different than just the uh, uh, for the programs for those who lost their jobs. So these are two categories. We must not confound that with unemployment insurance. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Gajevic Sayek. So what is our role as a, what is our role here in Quebec? Well, it's, it's good It's good because this connects what everybody is saying, uh, what the, the minister says and what uh, Mrs. Uh, because, uh, uh, what Mrs. Walmel says, uh, and because I'm committed uh, and mobilized with the youth and this uh, uh, connects with what you just said, Mrs. Picard, and believe me, I could listen to you a very long time because it's music to my ears, but it's fascinating to see that there's no studies that are being done right now. And, you know, this is exactly what we're doing with my research group. We're, we're doing a, a mapping of, of jobs uh, here in Canada, where are employments are that are more at risk and threatened and what we can do in order to train the personnel in order to redirect them in more less contaminating, polluting uh, industries. So, so how to help these employees across Canada. And I agree with you in Alberta, for sure. In Saskatchewan, we're talking about a very important uh, work, but it's not the case in Quebec. We can talk about the, uh, uh, the 
the the, the steel uh, cement aluminum factories uh, and there are a lot of concern among these workers and also uh, we want to go on the field and to and talk to you and talk to all these workers in order to understand their concerns uh, we can go to alberta we want to see the most contam con con contaminating businesses here in quebec and see the concerns of the workers and and our first study we have results we're going to publish them very soon and uh, this connects with what mi the minister says is that and also with the question that we're answering is that we have data that starts to show that a more just transition would be much more acceptable by the population and and more and, and more quick uh, and when we increase our uh, climate ambitions without taking care of the most affected workers the citizens that are most affected first nations that are most affected we lose support but if our increase our climate ambition we attach to this measures of just transition then the support everywhere in canada increases for uh, climate uh, energy transition and so this is something that will impact also a lot everything that you said mrs pika but also the pop the, the the population in general if the message of the governments were that we're there in order to take care of the population during we're there to help us uh, citizens were there yes for example you can talk about eco fiscality in quebec we should uh, have a uh, we we should uh, uh, the 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 polluting behavior should be a uh, uh, more punitive, we make it more expensive, but also we have to take care of the uh, population. And so increase uh, choices for more collective choices, uh, uh, make uh, to increase uh, the uh, electric uh, charge stations and to this, uh, this in a just way. So especially the most uh, vulnerable workers in the society, the citizens will be, will not be abandoned, as you said, in this uh, transition. And so our work, especially in our research group, is uh, to connect uh, the research, academic research with the civil society around these questions. So we want to connect science with society. And so our research and make these research uh, useful uh, for citizens and for governments and for different groups around the table that can help us uh, to make this transition by taking care of our population, but at the same time to accelerating it in order to achieve our targets quicker. But I think if according to our intuition is a good one, is if we are able to do this in a more just manner, we'll have more social acceptability. And we talk a lot about this in Quebec. Well, this acceptability will not come come down from heaven. So this is a message that we're, that we're taking care of people. Uh, we will, help this accessibility to be more accepted. And so I find it interesting everything that you're saying and it's our daily work. My group and I were working every day on these questions. Thank you very much. I understand that there's a study that uh, we will study and that will explain collectively for just transition and uh, job uh, mapping employment. And also you talked about uh, climate justice to pass from just transition to climate justice. So there are different measures within this that will impact uh, citizens. And so with the uh, co-fiscality, uh, the, the principality of the polluting uh, payer. And so what are our roles within this? Uh, can I, would you allow myself just to, I just want to react because honestly speaking, you're talking about music to my ears. It's the same thing what you just said. It's so inspiring and reassuring. I can say that I receive a, a text right now from our people who are in the environmental committee at the FTQ that, and we will have to work together. This is a great work together and with the environment, everybody's concerned. And so we really are uh, eager to meet you and to learn more about this study. Same thing for us. So before taking a few questions from our participants, we have 10 months before the next uh, COP. And we have a, a COP 15. We have notions of biodiversity with underlying ca causes that appear on the radar who call us on doing uh, systemic changes in our concept of our economies. Uh, 
So within this protect, we see the minister also who talks about sobriety. We don't know to what extent uh, they understand, but because of uh, and with all this, what is the approach? What is our dream regarding the participation of Quebec to COP28 uh, with the with these uh, COP15 and 27 that we just finished and all the commitments and what will be revealed this spring. In two minutes, if you could tell me your ideal regarding uh, this uh, for COP28. Uh, I'll start with Mrs. Picard. Thank you, I'll be quickly uh, because one minute goes. So again, uh, we need to put a lot of pressure so human rights will be considered in the final agreement of COP28. So also this will be a moment where mechanisms of funds are further loss and, uh, uh, and damages will be negotiation. The historic gains must not be diluted in the countries which will which keep uh, the implementation of this fund. We want uh, quick mechanisms uh, because during this time, people are dying every day because of the climate change and because COP28 will be the uh, fi finalizing of the uh, taking uh, considered as the heart of the Paris Agreement. This is a mechanism which allowed to measure the progress of Paris Agreement. We will not accept an evaluation that uh, that shows its failure. That being said, the most important aspect of on the question of hydrocarbons, the international community is already working in order to denounce uh, the president of COP28 and the link with the uh, uh, oil and gas company. And furthermore, we see that more and more the presence of the lobbyists of fossil fuels uh, from COP to COP. So we require formally and firmly the, that the, that the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change have have a definition on conflicts of interest and mechanisms to ensure a declaration of interest to see clearly in this and to act because of the economic changes in the coming years uh, will define our success or failure at a global level and F international level. And the FTQ is very firm that this uh, this uh, answer can go not go through the extension of oil and gas companies industry, but FTQ wants to gather so, 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 the civil society around consensus and work together. Finally, let us keep in mind that it it's not everybody who at this or at the same level and that our work is to gather together, assemble. Thank you very much, Mrs. Picard. Mr. Gajevic, well, I won't don't uh, very well said. I just want to add one element. I I agree with everything you said. I believe that if the one element that Quebec should work on and Canada should work on, even though Canada is not doing it well right now, but during this time re regarding the next cup is to internalize this message in the minds of international leaders. We have to change the flux of uh, final fi uh, international finance uh, towards a uh, 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 renewable energies so new uh, projects of oil and gas should should uh, we should not accept any more any new oil and gas project and we have to ensure especially in the uh, like the fme institutions and bilaterals that that we would understand the importance of of all this uh, money of uh, international finance towards renewable energy in order to abandon uh, all the and all the other elements of uh, transition and so we need to work this uh, with this uh, during the years because it's not well understood at the international level and uh, and i think this uh, w this question will be raised in the in the arab emirates uh. Claire? well my dream i would like to see as you said a youth committee to be established here in quebec uh, by uh, for cup uh, 28 i also would like that in the the update of the implementation of the PV, that we would see a revision of the target for Quebec. And so this would be very important for youth. And finally, I would repeat a little bit what my other co-panelists are saying, but especially Mrs. Picard, I remember that among the memorable experiences of COP27, there was an intervention by Patrick Rondeau on the question of introducing 
a definition, practical definition of the conflicts of interest, because I can talk about uh, youth and you saw that there's a strong movement in COP uh, in Montreal that is increasing and everywhere in Quebec. And there are young people who are feeling uh, who are feeling betrayed by the political institutions uh, to address this uh, situation of climate change. And there's a lack of trust in the cup. And we can see this also as a participant, as delegate. That was my dissent uh, time, COP27. And we can see more and more that the cups are beca becoming, I heard this, cups are, be are becoming festivals for the great pollu polluters to talk about their advances, nominal advances. So we have to make, we have to, we have to change have we have to change this so that these vibes do not uh, are not there present at the uh, at the cops and and to underscore the the conflicts of interest in the cop 27 and and the official delegations and and the and also the panels uh, panelists uh, so this is my vision uh, for cop 28 and i will finish by saying i know there's going to be a question period but I would just like to invite uh, those who are participating at this on this call to really think about about them also to join us if you're young in our meetings uh, with elected members and or and to uh, contact your elected uh, members uh, uh, before the COP28. Uh, it's not during the COP, but uh, the months preceding that we can make a difference. So that's my intervention. Thank you very much. And so we have a lot of messages regarding what we talk about the reduction of the target. We talked about the message of hope because there's a really something awakening up amongst young people regarding institutions and our, dec our decision makers. And also the question of just transition also is always very present. And also this will of having a declaration regarding conflicts of interest in order to give hope in these international processes if we want collectively to move forward. So many things, and I'm sure you could add. And so now we're going to go to the questions uh, that we're receiving. So I have a first one here from Catherine Gauthier. And so, uh, and so I read her. I will read her question. We're talking about. Uh, we talk about the act uh, uh, of doing more. If we have the resources here in Quebec in order to do more, in your opinion, what would be uh, different levers in order to accelerate uh, this? Uh, so either in, uh, and to increase our resilience. Uh, so somebody would like to answer. Yes, Mr. Sayeg. I think I will talk more about the question of re reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gases. So in Quebec right now, four uh, elements are very important, eco-fiscality. So we're very far from having uh, uh, policies of eco-fiscality. Uh, and so we really have to review this, our, these policies too. We have to diminish the number of permits uh, for carbon industry. Uh, there's too many permits. Uh, and so we're not able to diminish uh, quick uh, our emissions. And so we have to review this uh, and we have to diminish also the cap. Also to invest thirdly, more in active transportation. And we're, we're very far, I, we're very far uh, here in Quebec City, for example, of, uh, uh, from uh, Montreal. Uh, when I take, uh, where when I take the via rail train, I'm very far. And these are investments, especially uh, the last uh, uh, energy efficiency also that we have to invest uh, in renewable energies. So this will position us uh, as a province. And I can see that everything that I just said, these are things that, that would be beneficial for our economy. It's not just uh, beneficial, for the, beneficial for the environment, but everybody winning situation. And so we need a political will because then it will be winning uh, at the economic level and also environmental uh, level. And so these are, thank you very much. And I understand that you, uh, you really 
touched upon these proposals uh, for reduction of our greenhouse gases. And so I don't know, Mrs. Picard uh, or Mrs. Varmel, uh, regarding the resiliency of uh, climate change, the adaptation also, because we know that we are experiencing them already and that we have uh, uh, really basic changes uh, to be done in our society. Do you have any uh, suggestions uh, for levers in Quebec in order to accelerate uh, our res uh, yes, it's a very important. I think it's a good word to use at the same time. I, we talk a lot about dialogue because I think everybody, go, everything goes through there. And I, Alexandre was saying, yes, uh, the, the gas, uh, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the philosophies that we adhere to our group, uh, our work as a group as responsible for uh, and uh, the most vulnerable and medium side, uh, it's it's really to bring uh, that uh, to make to make sure that the young people are part of uh, the solutions, uh, the education programs, uh, and so it's really to bring the practical aspect of the environment so that each that and to raise awareness amongst our members to have more ethical uh, practices. And when we feel that in our on our daily we change something which is very simple maybe are not uh, they the, the could be facilitate what you're talking about mass transit uh, because the uh, there's no more investment in mass transit uh, from our municipalities uh, with the uh, old uh, equipment it's, this is very concerning and so in order to raise awareness in order for, uh, to to require from your municipalities to have mass transit uh, uh, services that are adequate in order to facilitate, yes, your, your life, but at the same time, it's a wonderful step for the environment. And so to be, uh, to have, to be practical between the message, which can scare people off, and for, an, and for a medium class, uh, average class a worker uh, can raise concerns. So to bring these, uh, to think uh, ethics, in our practices, this can make a big difference. Thank you very much. And so it's really through education. And this is what I hear very much the main uh, message. If you would allow me, I would go now to another question that uh, was asked. And this comes uh, by, by uh, comes from anne -Céline Guillon. And so very activist, uh, very engaged. And so the civil society of uh, Quebec is uh, very present. Uh, in the COP, how can we use this state of things to, in order to put our our weight, in order to uh, to take away the polluters that are from COPs? We talked about this conflicts of interest, but I feel that in her question, this is not enough. So, Claire, would you have to break the ice on this, or somebody else? Well, what I think. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. And so when I talk about the power of civil society in Quebec regarding the COPs, I think that without uh, when there are events like this to make the relationship between the participants at COP and the participants who remain in Quebec, let's say, well, that we would have more dialogue with these uh, great events uh, uh, in order to have a more amplified uh, voice on the actions and the claims that we do, advocation. And so that's the first thing. I don't, I don't think it's not maybe not the best answer, but maybe I would like to add something without going back to the preceding question. But when I think about the levers, I think less maybe at the practical aspects. I would say one element which is fundamental in the generation climate uh, action, if we take a political position in general, it's a, it's a macro position. And so we need to introduce, we need to integrate to our systems, to our decision process, a thought systemic thought in the future, there's economic phenomena in English, 
future discounting. So this means that we evaluate either the losses or the gains of the future as being less important than the gains or the losses that we can have in the present. And I think that if we include more people in general in our decision process, this will give us the opportunity to think more about the future and we're more, well, this is a fundamental, it's less practical, whatever the means, we need to integrate more and more. It has to be integrated to our decision process. Yes, it has to be uh, permanently in our mind. So Mrs. Picard, I think you wanted to add something. Yes, I just wanted to add something. Two things. First of all, I don't think that we're in a position of excluding anybody. However, the FTQ had called upon the minister for COP27 and what, what we are asking for COP28, it's not to uh, come to to see like a COP28 as a commercial a business uh, mandate uh, mission, but to include civil society. And this is will make a difference. Should we define more the def definition of uh, conflict of interest? Should we have a co commitment by participants to have a, a self-evaluation? For example, how can we say, uh, when we are analyze ourselves and to make a commitment uh, in writing, we don't want to have propaganda internally of the cops uh, that would uh, uh, really not help the wor this work, which is so important. But already, if the countries uh, are who are there at the uh, at the COP and they don't see this uh, as a commercial uh, commission. And this is a problem with Quebec. And we will remind the minister that we really want the civil society to be part of the debate of the COPs. That's very important for us. Thank you very much. And so you talked about uh, the COPs, of course, so we cannot exclude people, but a way to uh, give a parameter uh, to give a, uh, see how we're going to uh, work. And so a lot of work to do on this let's say. So listen, we're at the end of the panel and uh, I'm convinced that there would be other questions, but really we just have one minute left. And so I would like to thank Infinite, all of you for your, the, for your uh, discussions and all the advice and also the observations the conclusions also so that we can all achieve and be prepared for this next uh, COP28 and everything that we need to do meanwhile cup or no cup, we have to move forward. And so it was really an honor for me uh, to uh, facilitate this panel with you. And I hope that we will be able to continue with the dialogues uh, for the climate for COP28 shortly. And so thank you to all the participants today for listening to us and having contributed on our exchanges. And so thank you and we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't. I have the impression that uh, we still have a lot to say. Yes, thank you, thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Hi, bye, everybody.